Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Adrian. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's going to be time for some Victory 2 with Historical Flavor Mod in our Empire of Brazil tutorial campaign. So, last we left off, we have not yet unpaused the game, and we got through all the basics of the user interface as well as a little bit of the outliner. And so now we're actually going to unpause the game and get through some of the first early years of the game maybe you know 10 to 15 years who knows uh, how much um i just kind of want to show you guys what you're supposed to do in the early game as basically any country so there's a couple things you need to look at one um you want to look at your budget so we haven't unpaused the game yet we're likely to be generating a deficit right now um when we unpause the game we're not going to have too much money so first thing you want to do is you want to make sure your budget is going to be somewhat in the green you want to have some surplus of money to be able to fund troops, um, build forts, all sorts of good stuff. The second thing you want to do is you want to double check your technology. You want to double check that you are uh, researching some technology. It actually is just a good thing just to kind of see, okay, what technology do I need to go for? What will we need to take a look at? So um, as I was explaining in the very, very first episode of this tutorial campaign, the philosophy tree is one of the most important trees to go down because it gives you a straight buff to research points so our next philosophy tech is idealism which unlocks in the year 1840 so we're going to want to get a couple techs before then then we'll go for idealism to help out with everything else the quicker you research these philosophy techs the cheaper every other tech after it is so going down the philosophy tree is absolutely essential but i mean we there's so there's a few things that we could do uh we got commerce culture industry we can go for like basic chemistry, experimental railroads, mechanized mining. We can go for Malthusian thought, which gives us education efficiency, colonial migration, introspectionism, which gets us reinforcement as well as regular experience. Uh, we'll definitely want freedom of trade and we'll want early classical theory and critique. Probably, um, I guess let's start with Malthusian thought for the education efficiency and then we'll come back for these commercial texts and some of the industrial texts. And then in 1840, we'll get idealism. Okay. And you always you also want to do double check what type of party you have in power. So right now we have the Partido Conservador, which is protectionism, interventionism, pluralism, limited citizenship, jingoism, and we have no official welfare policy. We do have a decision. So this is a decision specific for historical flavor mod for HFM. This allows you to pick um, a certain trade policy. Right now we're we're not going to worry about it because you could prioritize tariffs. There actually is. A protectionism trade policy but we're not gonna worry about it we want a flexible trade policy so if we have to put tariffs we can and if we want more to focus on taxes then we can do that as well um, so we are at war right now we are at war Brazil is one of the interesting countries because there are you know, there's a lot of wars going on in the beginning of the, of the world or the beginning of the campaign but this one in particular is kind of um, kind of interesting in that we're at war with the Rio Grande do Sul. So we have 12,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry we're going to fight. That's part of this army. So we're going to want to annex this this province, obviously. We have an army of 30,000 in Rio de Janeiro. We have 9,000 carrossiers, 21,000 infantry, and in our Ejercito Imperial, we have a general by the name of De Lages, and he gives us 40% morale and 10% plus experience for this army so he's a pretty good general so that's good um we do have a couple decisions right now that we could take we could take a decision to increase the conscription time which will affect over here in our reforms tab as you guys remember i was explaining in your political tab you have a bunch of reforms social reforms and political reforms one of the reforms you're gonna have is conscription so right now we have two-year draft so those conscripts are drafted for two years or 24 months that means that our mobilization size of our poor strata is increased by two percent but we have more of a production impact we could double that from 2% to 4%. Our immigration attraction will go down. Mobilization impact will go up. But we do get more land starting experience. And we also are able to double the amount of troops that we can mobilize from 2% to 4% of the poor strata. Think of it like Hearts of Iron 4 and conscription laws in that sense. So, I don't know. I don't actually know if we're going to mobilize or not. We could draft our citizens. I don't actually know if we will. Let's go increase conscription time just because. Let's see. We have some sort of special decision here. Ever since the colonization of the Empire of Brazil, the natives have been relegated to a marginal role in Brazilian society. Marginalized or simply ignored, the natives are growing increasingly militant about their status while other countries turn their gaze on our treatment of the first peoples of the Empire of Brazil. 
There are talks in Rio de Janeiro about an official policy in regards to our treatment of the natives. Should we keep the status quo, give them full rights, try to assimilate them into British culture, or Brazilian culture? Should we drive them to the edge of extinction? Well, we can go ahead and take that. Let's go and take the decision. And as you can see, it it opens up a, a new kind of decision tree. There's a couple of different, different options that we can actually pick here. So we have three different choices. We have the Protection Act, the Integration Act, and the Suppression Act. Okay. So the Suppression Act looks like it suppresses Indians, or kind of drives them to extinction, I guess. You get six infamy and you lose 50,000 pounds from that decision. The Integration Act will give you a little bit of infamy, you lose 100,000 pounds, and it looks like you... Yeah, you get the Native Assimilation Act, which increases your infamy, which is bad. Infamy, just in case if I haven't explained it, infamy in this game is like aggressive expansion. You can go up to a maximum of 25 infamy, after 25 infamy, countries can declare coalition wars on you. They're very, very painful. Don't go over 25 infamy unless you are absolutely sure you can de defeat basically the entire world in a coalition war. So, the Protection Act will have us lose infamy, will increase the amount of pops that want full citizenship, and we actually add a few cultures into our accepted cultures. Gorani, Amazonian, and Tupinamba. So that sounds like something we want to go for. But we can't get it right now because we need to be at peace. We also need to own all of our core provinces. And we have to have a party that supports either citizenship policy is full citizenship or we have to have a proletarian dictatorship because, you know, communism. So for now, we can't do much with the native status decision uh, tree. So we're just going to go ahead and just, just close it down. We'll, we'll open it up later. And we have a bunch of other decisions, but they're all locked right now. So maybe when we're at peace, we'll have some other stuff to deal with. You can come over here to the politics tab and you can actually take a look right up here by the name of your tab, politics. It'll show you modifiers that are going on within your country. National modifiers. Right now we have three. We have one that says law changed. We have a baby boom until 1842. Improvements in life conditions in our country are leading to a countrywide baby boom. Cool. And then we have the new world until 1866. We get population growth plus 0.10%, which is a shit ton. That is absolutely enormous. And then we have my immigrant attraction plus 50%. Let me teach you guys a little bit before we pause the game here and defeat Rio Grande Sul. Let me teach you a little bit about migration. So basically during the entire game, people are going to come from Europe, Asia, Africa. They're going to migrate to the new world. This is historical with what occurred during the 19th century is that there were plenty of people in the early 1800s, there were people usually from Western Europe, Northern Europe, Belgium, Sweden, Germany, you name it, that came to either the United States, a lot of them went to Brazil, a lot of them went to Mexico, things like that. Mostly democracies is, is countries that immigrants would prefer to go to because a lot of immigrants here in Europe wanted to escape the Catholic reactionary dictatorial regimes, you know, that existed, for instance, in the Austrian Empire, in Italy, there was a lot of conscription that went on. The Kingdom of France was particularly reactionary for a time. Uh, Spain as well. The Carlist Wars were going on. In Portugal, actually, there were the liberal wars between Dom Pedro I and Maria, who was the heir to the Portuguese throne, and then Miguel, his brother. There were the liberal wars going on there. There was the war between Belgium and the Netherlands for Belgian independence. The Belgian War of Independence was in 1830. You had the Italian Wars of Unification over here from 1856 onward. You had the Austro-Prussian War, uh, the Schleswig-Holstein War with, you know, Denmark and, and Prussia. Whole bunch of war going on. Uh, a lot of, later on in the 1800s, a lot of migrants would move from Eastern Europe to the Americas primarily. Um, some to Brazil, but most, most almost always the United States. Uh, a little bit of Mexico as well, because Mexico is quite large in 1836. So, they're pretty big. So, as Brazil, right, we are... A constitutional monarchy we are a for the most part democratic regime we are secondary power not to mention we have modifiers like this the new world modifier it gives us immigrant attraction plus 50 percent basically that means that a lot of people from eastern europe europe in general actually are going to migrate to our empire brazil which means our population is going to grow rapidly which is very 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 important Right now, our population is 1.57 million adult males, which is fairly large 
compared to all of our neighbors. For example, I could take a look at Colombia, or Colombia as you would say, right? So they are, for now, at least a republic, but they have 500,000 adult males. We have 1.57 million, so for every one Colombian male, we have three Brazilian males. That is enormous. That is an enormous difference in population. Let's take a look at the United States, right? The United States doesn't even control all of its modern borders yet in 1836. They have 4.14 million adult males. That is a lot. So for every, almost every one Brazilian male, the Americans have four, four American males. So population is a seriously big deal in this game. The countries with the largest population usually have the highest tax base, usually have the largest armies, and they sometimes have problems with social reforms. If you have a very, very large population, you usually have to have an enormous bureaucracy. You have to have very high pensions, unemployment subsidies, minimum wages, things like that. But depending on how you are as a ruler, right? If you can mostly advance social reforms from a position of conservatism, from a position of statism, your population is really just a bonus. There's, there's never too many issues with having too large of a population. Having more and more and more and more people is actually really, really good for a country for the most part. But obviously the, the simulation of Victoria 2 is not perfect at defining and, and kind of representing real world issues, but at least for the, for the purposes of Victoria 2, having an enormous population is really, really, really important for a country. So we're going to want to attract immigrants to the Empire of Brazil to the best of our ability. Once we unpause, I think you guys will see that we'll be getting a lot of migrants into the Empire of Brazil. Anyway. Okay, so we got our technology. Hopefully we have our economy, we'll, we'll come together and get and get in order and get in shape. Um, we're at war with the Rio Grande Sul, so we're going to need to go and occupy this guy's territory and annex him in a war. Let's see. So if, if I click a, a country, the Rio Grande Sul, and I come over here to the Show Great Powers, there's a little there's a little tab here. This is, this is the country information. This shows everything from their score to their rank in the world, uh, their population. They have 125,000 adult males. This will also show you their accepted cultures. They have Brazilian and Platinean as accepted cultures. That's in contrast to ours, right? I can come over here to our country, right click on the Empire of Brazil, and I can see our accepted cultures. We only accept Brazilian. So if I come over here to the Rio Grande do Sul, come down here in the bottom right corner and click on culture, I can see what is the culture of the Rio Grande do Sul. They have mostly Brazilian people. They have some Guarani as well, and they have a couple Afro-Brazilian and you can see here in Uruguay, there's actually a lot of Platinean people. So maybe these Platinean people would want to move to the Rio Grande do Sul, or people from the Rio Grande do Sul would want to go to more Platinean territories. Rio Grande do Sul accepts both cultures, whereas we only accept one. So I can actually take a look at our own country, right? We have enormous swathes of territory that are Amazonian, Guarani, Afro-Brazilian, anything else around here? Not that I can see, at least for now. What's actually interesting is that as soon as we start getting a lot of immigrants, you can you will actually start to see foreign cultures pop up around the map. Like, you can see French people here, German people here, you know, British people here. You'll actually see little pockets of, you know, different foreign cultures that are not accepted in your in your country that will have their own little, you know, pockets around your, around your nation. It's pretty cool. Same thing as in real life, you know? Um... Like over here, I can take a look at the culture map mode for the United States. You've got a lot of Native American miners over here. You've got a lot of Dakota over here. You've got Yankees in the north, Dixies in the south, as well as African uh, Americans, Afro Americans. And you'll actually see little pockets of foreign cultures pop up. Polish, German, Italian, you name it. You know, over here, we have even like Cadians over here, you know. Anyway. So, to unpause, I think we're ready for this war. I think we're ready to move this army down south and annex the Rio Grande do Sul. We shouldn't have too many issues. We outnumber their army two to one. We are recruiting artillery in Rio de Janeiro. They're going to take a little while to, to be created. So we're just going to move the army south immediately. We're going to want to stick primarily towards the coast because the coast usually has the highest supply limit. I believe there actually is a supply limit mod uh, map mode right here. So I can, so this is uh, the shortcuts G if you want to, if you want to use shortcuts. Supply limit map mode. So I can select this army and it's going to show me in what provinces you're going to take attrition, 
and what provinces you're going to be just fine, where, where you can support your troops. This is very important. You guys got to listen to me on this one. You take attrition in, okay, so in Europa Universalis 4, right, for movement, you take attrition only at the monthly tick, right? So I could go from the 1st of January, 1836 to February 1st, 1836. In Europa Universalis 4, I would only take attrition in that province on the monthly tick from January 31st to February 1st. That is not the way that Victoria 2 works. Victoria 2, you take attrition every time you set down in a province. So if I'm going to move from Rio de Janeiro to Santos, there's going to be no attrition. The supply limit's good. If I went from Santos to San Paulo, I'm still okay. But if I went from, say, Santos to Iguape, right? The supply limit here is technically 30, but because of the terrain and other modifiers, actually, I think it's particularly the terrain, we would actually take attrition if we were to go into this little province of Iguape. As soon as we touch down, as soon as I go from Santos to Iguape, you would take attrition. So you got to keep that in mind when moving troops around. Because attrition, very, very easily, can absolutely wipe out your manpower like it's nothing. It's very, very different than Europa Universalis 4. I actually prefer Europa Universalis 4's movement system. But I can see why in Victoria 2, they do have the system that they do. Just because your troop numbers are much, much larger. Moving 30,000 men from, you know, here to here... And all the way from Rio de Janeiro down to damn near Argentina. You, you know, the attrition system makes sense. It's not it's not as simplistic as Europe Universalis 4. So anyway, let us let us go really, really slow. We're gonna go to like speed one or two, and we're gonna come down here and we're gonna destroy Rio Grande do Sul. We're gonna annex them back into the Empire of Brazil. Let's also take a look at our national foci. You guys might remember in our previous episode, because our administrative efficiency sucks all across the empire that I put our bureaucrats, or I put our national foci to encourage bureaucrats in our two most populous states, which are Rio de Janeiro and Bahia. If you want to find out where that is, I could come over here to national focus map mode, which is the hotkey of P, and these are where I have my national foci right now. So in these two states, which are our most populous, we're going to try and encourage bureaucrats. Alternatively, I can just come over here to the region map mode, which is a shortcut T on your keyboard, and I can take a look at where the states are. So this is the Rio de Janeiro state. And this is the Mahia state. This national foci, this percentage here, is the percentage of the population of those regions that's bureaucrats. It also shows you your state administrative efficiency. So in Rio de Janeiro, we have 43.1%. And in Bahia, we have 43.8%. As soon as the state administrative efficiency hits 100%, these percentages will turn red. It will let you know, hey, you don't need more bureaucrats. Put them somewhere else. We will wait for that to happen. So in the meantime, we're going to take a look at this army here. We're going to unpause real fast. Let's go on speed two. Let's take a look at how our economy is doing, how much money we're going to be losing, all sorts of stuff. So as you can see right now, we're losing a little bit of money. A little bit of money. It's not too bad. We could actually probably go up to speed three, I think would be acceptable. So we have an army in Santos. Let's go to Sao Paulo. Saracabo, Saro, Sarocaba, uh, Castro, and then Lajes. Let's do that. Ooh! This guy got a little bit bigger of an army. He actually has uh, some more inventory. I think he might have mobilized a little bit. Interesting. Okay. So let's go destroy this guy's army. We may play defensively for a bit, just because he does have a lot of troops kind of running around the place. Let's go to Castro real fast. So he's taking attrition, as, as you guys can see at the moment. He's taking attrition by sitting in this province and trying to siege it. Okay. So he's got 24,000 inventory, 3,000 cavalry, and the terrain in this province is Grassland Hills, which really is... that We wouldn't really receive any penalties from attacking him in that position as you guys can see there is a river here you guys can see there's a river if i was to go from say i don't know Garapuava or castro technically 
If I was to attack him in Lajes, we would take a river crossing penalty. So let's go and split this army right now. Let's have 15,000 go to Garopuava. And then we're going to have 15,000 San Castro. And I want to see... I want to see if this guy will attack me across the river. He may go to Curitiba as well. We'll see what he does. In the meantime, we will wait for our artillery to be done producing. In fact, we may even want to mobilize just to get a few troops. Just to get a few troops available for this. Let's see what he's going to do. Looks like he's going for Destero. Okay. He's going to try and siege down Destero. We may want to attack him in that position, actually. We may want to attack him there. Because we can move from Sao Miguel to Lajes, retake this fort, and then just move from here to go there. And we wouldn't really take any penalties for combat. As long as we could have the full combat with, we'd probably do just fine. So he's trying to siege this down. He's going to take a little bit of attrition there. In fact, I think we will actually probably do that. We will attack him most likely. So we took, as you guys can see, we took attrition a little bit from coming into this province. Okay, so we have 28,000 to his 24,000. I wonder if we can see what type of general he has. I don't think I can. I say we engage him. If it is that we don't do too well, we can always mobilize troops in Rio de Janeiro. We do have the province set as a rally point. We can always mobilize troops. So let's attack him here and let's see how he does. In fact, we before we do this, we can actually take a look at his military tech. So let's go and take a look at our military tech. We have 4 out of 30 military techs. If I was to go over here to the Rio Grande do Sul, I can come over here, I could right-click on his country, go to Show Wars, and hover over his army. He's got 10 brigades, but he has 4 out of 30 military tech as well. So we have the exact same military tech. Even being 1 or 2 techs ahead could give us a decisive advantage against him, but I think we're going to be fine for now. We have a pretty good general, so... Uh, ooh, actually, you know what? Mm, no, we do not. No, oh, we have the wrong general here. We have defense plus three, but we have morale, speed, and experience. Went down, actually. Hmm. Alright, let's actually go to Kuritaba then. And we're gonna go get our good general. Let's see, Venezuela wants an alliance. Venezuela is pretty neutral with everybody in South America, but oftentimes Colombia and Venezuela will go to war. So I'm actually going to go ahead and decline that alliance, at least for now. We don't want to kind of embroil ourselves in other people's affairs for the time being. Okay, let's grab our good general. Where is he? This guy. Is there anybody else that's better? This guy's not bad. He's got an attack and defense. Let's go for De La Hes, though. And we're going to make it so this, this army is not auto-assigning generals. So where's this guy going to go? He's going to go to Porto Alegre. Okay, so it looks like he's going to go for San Miguel. He's going to take a little bit of attrition when he gets there. He actually replenished a bit. Okay, so we outnumber him a bit. And what we could do is I could cross the river and attack him. I, I would have superior numbers of troops. I don't, have as, I don't have as much inventory as he does, but we have a lot of cavalry. We have three regiments of cavalry on his flanks. So presumably his flanks would crumble under the cavalry attack. The thing is, is how good his general is. That's the question. Usually you don't want to attack across the river, but I'm willing to do so. Let's try it. If it doesn't work out, we can always mobilize. Let's see. Demand concession CB against Wolof by the King of France was detected. Interesting. Ecuador wants an alliance. I will also go ahead and decline. And what? So this is this terrain here is also grassland hills. So we should really be seeing no terrain penalties. It's just it's just a river crossing. Let's take a look. 
Ooh. We actually took quite a bit of a hit here. Crossing terrain. Terrain penalty on attacker. Why is that? Oh, okay. Actually, so Grassland Hills actually does give you a minus one. Or does gives you a minus one roll because it grants you defense plus one. Okay. Ooh, maybe this war won't go very well then. Let's see. We do outnumber him quite a bit. It's actually kind of weird that the cavalry deployed right here in the middle. But that does mean that his, his center is going to crack pretty easily. Yeah, so we have equal organization. Pretty good strength. We did take a minus one from the crossing, as well as we get a minus one because of the terrain. Because Grassland Hills grants the defender defense plus one. Uh, this is your combat width as well. Your combat width will actually get smaller the more the game progresses. And it, basically, the combat system is almost exactly like European Resolves 4. You have random dice rolls. Not to mention, you have modifiers to your troops based on your generals. So right now, all of our troops have plus 40% morale because of our general. And they get experience 10% faster. The enemy general is actually pretty good. He's got attack plus 2, morale plus 20%. He's got reliability plus 2%. The thing is, we are attacking. We're not... He's, he's defending, we're attacking. So he's not able to make use of his plus 2 attack roll. His morale is 20%, but ours is 40. So also, we have that advantage inherently already. So we got a 7 to a 2. Let's see what the next roll is going to be. Okay, so it's still 7 to a 2. And now we got a 0 to a 3. Looks like we're still winning pretty decisively, I would say. Okay, so it looks like he retreated. So we killed 13,000 Rio Grande soldiers. And we lost 4,000 Brazilians of our own. Mostly infantry, some cavalry. We killed more cavalry, though. We killed a lot of infantry. And so he takes 2.2 war exhaustion from that, and he loses 1.86 prestige. We get 0 0.57 war exhaustion, we get 2 prestige from the victory. As you guys can see now, his army, which is shattered... <clears throat> excuse me. His army, which is shattered, is going to retreat to Paso Fundo. We can make the decision to follow him if we want. I think considering our strength, we probably should. I think that would be something wise to do. We may be able to get a stack wipe against him. His army will arrive in Paso Fundo on the 8th of June. We arrive on the 9th. Um, he's going to get more defense, but we do outnumber him quite a bit. We'll take a little bit of attrition on the arrival, but I think we will be okay. Let's see how we do. So he's entrenched a little bit. So this dig in, the longer you stay in a province, you dig in. You you kind of entrench. Think of it like Hearts of Iron 4 and Engineers, is that you can entrench in a province. The longer an attack goes on, then the dig in bonus will go away. Alternatively, if an attacker has things like Engineers, Artillery, uh, Armor, Airplanes, your entrenchment also does, it, it kind of goes away. You negate the effect of the entrenchment. So we got a four to his one. Ooh, we got a negative one to his eight. That's pretty bad. And then we got a three to his eight again. All right, so we lost 2,000 Brazilians. We killed 5,000 of his army. I think we still pursue him, because I think we're going to be winning this pretty decisively. We should win this war. Hopefully we get out of here before we take the attrition tick. Wow. I think we actually arrived with the enemy army on the same day. We still take a minus two. We don't get a crossing penalty this time, though. We just take a terrain penalty. And it looks like we're going to stack wipe the force. Let's see. We lost 747 men to kill 2,500. No, he's still going to retreat. Damn. Well, we've got him on the run now. So let's go and destroy his army. We can probably... We actually probably won't need to mobilize for this then. So let's go and mobilize. Just call off the troops. We've got artillery over here. Let's go send them to Destero so we can um, siege some stuff. So as you guys can see, we've been taking quite a few losses for our troops. At the beginning of the game, we had enough manpower to support 11 regiments. Now we can only support 4. So all these men, as you can see, these regiments, they're each made up of individual soldiers, right? 
all the soldier icons with red means that you can no longer reinforce those those troops. There's not enough men from your country to reinforce these brigades. So we should wrap up this war relatively soon. There we go. We got a sec wipe. Cool. Now, to avoid taking much more attrition, we're actually going to go ahead and just start sieges. We should siege... Eh, it, it progresses at a decent rate, I suppose. So, while we're waiting here for these sieges, there's two things you should keep in mind. Is One, there's recon efficiency. Two, is there siege efficiency. So, recon efficiency is the ability of this army's scouts to reduce the dig-in bonus of enemy armies and speed up sieges. Certain units will give you recon. Usually, it's units like Hussars. Hussars give you two reconnaissance per Hussar brigade. And Dragoons will give you one reconnaissance per brigade. So, Cuirassiers are usually the best attacking cavalry, but they don't give you any recon. Hussars are usually the weakest attacking cavalry, but they give you a lot of recon. And then Dragoons are kind of in the middle. They're pretty good at attack. They give you a little bit of reconnaissance. They're okay at defense, and they move fairly quickly. Hussars are also the fastest moving cavalry. Hussars can move 6 kilometers per hour, whereas Dragoons and Cuirassiers can only move at 5 kilometers per hour. Now, there also are units in the game called Engineers. Engineers give you Siege. The more Engineers you have, the faster your Sieges can speed up. The thing is, is Engineers are not that great at attacking, so you gotta keep that in mind. Don't have, don't have Engineers in the front line. What's also interesting is there is just kind of a generic Cavalry unit called Cavalry. Don't recruit them unless you're an uncivilized nation. You can't recruit Dragoons, Crossiers, or Hussars until you have better technology. So at the beginning of the game, if you're an uncivilized nation, you may only be fielding cavalry. Cavalry are unique in that they have pretty crappy defense and attack, but they actually do provide reconnaissance. So if you're an uncivilized nation, having a lot of cavalry will speed up sieges fairly by a fair bit. Let's actually go ahead and wait for... Um, let's wait for the sieges down here to finish before we, before we come up and siege these back. What's also unique, actually, is sieges are affected to some degree by the force, by the size of your force that's sieging something down. It's it, it's kind of like it's kind of like Crusader Kings two in a sense. The more troops you have that outnumber a garrison, the faster your siege will progress. If you want to be efficient, though, you're gonna want to you're gonna want engineers in your you're gonna want engineers in your um in your army. It's just it's just oftentimes more efficient to have engineers to siege provinces down than it is to outnumber the fort because of attrition. Attrition is just really, really, really powerful. You you could have 80,000 troops to siege down a fort, or you could have 40,000 troops with engineers to siege at the same speed. So let's see who wants here. Chile wants an alliance. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at real quick at the countries that are around here in, um, in South America. So we have Chile, who's a republic, civilized nation. Chile is one of the um, one of the most democratic nations in South America at this time. So they may be a nice friend of ours. They have tensions with Bolivia, as you guys can see. We have the Argentine Confederation, or um, they, they also call it Rio de la Plata, but just they're they're the Argentine Confederation for for all intents and purposes. So they are a civilized nation. Right now, they are under the control of a presidential dictatorship, and they are also at war with Peru, Bolivia, South Peru, and Peru. They're allied with Corrientes and Entre Rios. Uh, Entre Rios, which is here, and Corrientes are sub-states of the Argentine Confederation. So, from the name, as it implies, they are a confederation. They are a confederation of states that have their own autonomy, but there also is kind of a weak central government. The Argentine Confederation, Corrientes, and Entre Rios are just states that are aligned together. Basically, the Argentine Confederation has these guys as puppets. That's what they're called, puppet states. Um, they're also a presidential dictatorship, right? So they're not democratic. They don't have elections. They can appoint a ruling party, but there is no elections. So don't count on them being as a friend to democracy for the time being. 
And then there's Uruguay. Uruguay used to be uh, Brazilian. For now, it's not, but perhaps we can remedy the situation. There also is the Republic of Paraguay. Uruguay is a republic. Paraguay is actually a presidential dictatorship. They also have no elections at all. They can appoint the ruling party, though. And we actually have cores on a little bit of Paraguay up here. So we may want to take those cores back at some time. And then we have the Peru-Bolivian Confederation over here. So Peru-Bolivia was a country. And they controlled Peru and Bolivia, as the name implies, in a confederation. It eventually did break down around this time. So they're not likely to survive. They're actually at war right now. Yeah, with, uh, with Argentina. So likely, well, it could be anybody's game, actually. Argentina has some cores over here. They have a little bit of cores over here. So we'll see. We'll see who wins that war. These guys are also a presidential dictatorship. So basically, we have two dictatorial states fighting each other. So neither of which is really our friend. Chile is, is democratic, so they could be our friend. Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela are actually all democracies right now. Up here, we have the Federal Republic of Central America, the FRCA. Um... They also, there's another name of it, it's called the USCA, the United States of Central America, but the FRCA is technically the official official name. Um, the FRCA breaks down into civil wars by around this time, the 1830s, early 1840s, so likely the FRCA will not survive. As you guys can see, Nicaragua is already split off, and Nicaragua is a presidential dictatorship, so a dictatorial state is split off from the FRCA, so likely the FRCA probably won't be around for too much longer, but you never know. Anything can happen in Victoria 2. So, I think, um, since not too much is happening, we can go ahead and speed up to speed four. Let's see, we did build another artillery regiment over here, so let's go ahead and transfer those guys over here to go to, um, Curitiba, I guess you would call it. Okay, so we took, uh, the capital here, of the Rio Grande do Sul, and as you can see, we are winning the war quite decisively. It's us versus the Rio Grande do Sul, we are winning by 57%. I can come over here to the Rio Grande do Sul and I can propose peace and this will show us how much war score we need to annex the Rio Grande do Sul. We need 85% war score. So we have to siege down a little bit more before these guys are going to be willing to acquiesce to our demands. Basically, as soon as you have a country 100% occupied, you have 100% war score. And really, they, they can't resist any peace deal after that. Let's take a look at our bureaucrats real fast. So we are still encouraging um, bureaucrats. Our administrative efficiency is slowly but surely increasing. It's going to take a little bit of time, though. It usually takes takes a few years. And let's go over here to technology real fast. So we're, we're researching a Malthusian thought. If I hover over the current research, I can actually see when this tech, excuse me, will be completed. So right now, we're going to complete this tech in 1838. March 4th, 1838. So, okay. Until that time, let's just finish up this war with the, uh, the Rio Grande do Sul. Excellent. Let's take a look at the supply limit here. Some of these provinces here. So, Santa Maria. I can actually move the full army to Santa Maria and we wouldn't have any problems. Hopefully we can get there before the attrition tick. Nice. I think we did. Alrighty. So the occupation is going by pretty quick. We siege stuff down pretty fast. That's good. Okay. Now our army at full strength is a little too large to be able to be supported here in this province, but I think that's okay. Let's double check real fast if we can still... So we have exactly 85 war score right now. He's still not willing to make peace though, so we're going to have to siege him down completely all the way. So, we took a little bit of attrition in going into this province, which is unfortunate. Ooh! Let's check it out. We have an event here. The Capanagam Revolution. Until 1822, Grau Para had been a separate vice royalty from Brazil, reporting herself directly to Portugal. The vice royalty united with Brazil in the fight against Portugal, but once the fight for independence ended and a provincial government named by the Brazilian emperor was installed, the local leaders were marginalized from power. A rebellion broke out in 1831 in the military of, uh, garrison of Belém, Involving one of the leaders, Batista Campos, which was who was jailed. The indignation of the poor grew, and in 1833, already there was talk of converting Brazil into a federation. The provincial president unleashed a repressive political wave in an attempt to contain the separatists. Okay. So let's go take a look real fast. 
There's a state called Graupara. Where is it? Somewhere over here. It's actually way up here. So this state of Graupara, I think, is going to have some separatist tendencies. Yeah, so any province gets nationalist agitation until 1840. So we're going to have some separatists. Okay. So I can actually come over here to the revolt risk map mode, and it'll actually show me if there is any sort of chance of uh, revolt here. Likely, our militancy is just going to increase by quite a bit. But not necessarily... We're not necessarily going to see rebels right now at this very moment, but we probably will see rebels soon. It might happen. Let's see. Restauración. Following the defeat of Napoleon, the Congress of Vienna convened to redraw Europe. In Italy, the Congress restored the pre-Napoleonic patchwork of independent governments, either directly ruled or strongly influenced by the prevailing powers. Ooh. Okay. They should be able to acquiesce now. So we have a 100% war score, complete victory. We can go ahead and force our demands to annex the Rio Grande Sol right now. And they accept. Okay. So this is an interesting, uh, interesting event. So we, today we've claimed the Rio Grande Sol. Now is the issue of slavery. There is a difference. If your country has slavery enabled, you can have slave states and free states. We have the decision right now whether or not we want this place to be a slave state or a free state. Right now, it's actually a slave state, but we could actually choose to create a free state. Um, let's actually take, is, is there any other states that are free? It looks like the Brazilian Amazonas, Brazilian Mato Grosso. Those are all slave states. I think, uh, yeah, just, just, it looks like the Mato Grosso, the Amazonas are free states. Everything else is actually slave states. Okay. Well, do we even have slaves down here right now? We do. We do have slaves in this workforce. There are slaves here. So, let's actually go take a look here. Let's go take a look at the Rio Grande do Sul. It's actually 14% of this workforce is slaves. So, creating a free state, uh, free state would maybe piss people off a little bit. So, we're probably going to want to extend slavery here, which is what we're going to do. Let's select our army. It looks like uh, Uruguay is having some sort of revolution here. Interesting. Let's go and split this guy off. Split off this army. Let's go to Pelotas and Alegrete. And now we're just going to go... Now we're going to wait in peace for a while. As you can see, our manpower has increased a little bit. Particularly with the annexation of... The Rio Grande do Sul, there's a lot of professional soldiers here in this area that we can now raise for ourselves. We can now have them as our troops. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Why don't we go ahead and do that? Well, first, let's take a look. Do we want to reorganize our armies at all? So we have Carrossiers, and they're pretty good, but they don't have any recon. I think I would like some, some cavalry with some recon in our force. So why don't we go ahead and disband the Carrossiers... Let's go and disband these Carrossiers. And why don't we raise Dragoons instead? Let's get like two Dragoon regiments. We could use some more artillery. And maybe one more regiment of infantry. So right now we don't have any cavalry in our in our divisions, but, or in our armies, but that's okay. So we're going to raise some more troops. Right now this is our Empire Brazil. And there's a few things that we could do, right? We could just stay at peace right now. We could just focus on our bureaucracy. Get people, you know, starting to become bureaucrats. We can focus on education, things of that sort. Or we could go to war. We could go to war if we wanted to against Paraguay. We could go to war against Uruguay. Let's take a look real fast at our migrations. Who is migrating where? So it looks like Colombia at the moment is receiving a lot of immigrants from countries here in Europe, particularly people are leaving Sweden, Britain, Prussia, and France. And a lot of them are going to Colombia, but as you can see, the majority are going to Mexico, which is an empire right now, or a presidential dictatorship, under Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. And a lot of people are going to the United States. Over 2,700 people are going to the United States. They're migrating there, so that's, that's quite a bit. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe war is not the right decision right now. Maybe we, on, we want to actually wait. We could take over a country like Paraguay or Uruguay, but we could also just not. We don't have to go to war. You got to remember that Victoria 2 is not a war game. It's not about going to war. You want 
to focus on other things than war. For the purposes of this campaign, because I want to teach you guys how to peacefully run a country, we'll only go to war if absolutely necessary, or if it's just a really, 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 really good opportunity. We're actually going to go in and refrain from declaring offensive wars of our own. We can only declare for course. We'll just make that as a rule. So, okay. It's the year March 19th, or it's, it's 1837, March 19th, 1837. Uh, We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll progress a little more into the early years of the game in the next episode. So thank you so much for watching as always. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. I'll see you guys very soon. Thanks so much.